Thank you very much. Uh, well, thanks for everyone here to still come to the morning lecture, even if the days are extending a bit. So this morning, well, in my talk, the focus will be mainly from the subject, so, well, on prediction, but mainly because of dynamic environments. So when you have things moving and can be moving quite fast in the environment, how you can deal with it with, well, neural systems and neural fields. So as Gregor explained, so now I'm currently at Pascal Institute, so it's more a vision and robotics lab, but actually I went through different fields and different labs, so I should really thank colleagues, not only from here, but from other places I've been at. So I've be, I will be presenting stuff done with many collaborators. So, um, well, this is more, let's say, the classical view in the kind of my lab right now. So that cognition is only made after perception, so you get this classical loop that you can find in many things outside, let's say, cognitive uh, robotics, where you have stimulation, perception, cognition, and then only you take commands and send them, for instance, to robots. Whereas, actually, when you do that, uh, even on robots, if you go to control theory people, there are feedbacks everywhere to regulate stuff, to control, because things change in time. So you cannot make a plan, just apply it, and not adapt to changes. So, first thing, you have like the closed loop control, often going through the body, interaction with the environment, and feedback from the senses. And also inside, uh, let's say, the brain of the agent, you have also feedbacks that can take the form of efferent copies of many, many things, but that can be interpreted in terms of prediction. So you predict what state might happen after your actions, you might predict the dynamics of your well, neural fields inside, and so on. So you find this, of course, in humans, where you have uh, kinesthetic and proprioceptive feedback. You also get direct actions on your senses, like moving the eyes to get information, and all this stuff. And as well, you, do, you can do the same exactly in robotics, and it helps for many tasks. And to give an example, uh, in, I'm interested uh, mainly in Activision right now. So there are, either it's a camera and eye, both are working. Uh, so if you have a very wide angle camera and you need to process everything, it can be not very efficient. It can be quite complex because you don't really know where the stimulation are. But what you can do is just go to something much more narrow, like for instance the retina of there, and move it around. So you kind of transfer what was sensation into actions. So you, there is a trade-off between the two. And then especially in robotics, you can even do the same that you can find in the eye, having some very high resolu resolution, let's do it this way, in the center, like the fovea retina, and have a more broad, coarse camera that gets a wide view. So you can combine this type of thic things and use action to move it. Um, so this is done uh, even in like CMOS cameras, some of them are working this way, and of course you can do it in simulation quite easily. And the second aspect of Activision, so this is more what is called the overt aspect, so where you do actions in the environment. And you get the covert aspect, which is instead of processing, even if it's small, everything that you perceive, you can select, but based on, on what your attention is or what you predict, you can only process some elements that are of interest, predict their dynamics, but not process everything. So this is kind of easy, it should remember you what you can find with neural fields. Once you have the focus on some elements, you might not need to process everything anymore. But you need to then focus on something that is of interest. So that's the main problem. And so this is called, like in attention mechanisms, so you have the overt one and the covert one. So I will try. So this is the first live demo, so it won't work, of course. Uh, to do a very small uh, psychological experiment, so we'll just start something in parallel. So I hope it will be working. Yes. Uh, okay, so let's go back here. So you will see some stimuli in the center appearing. And the goal, uh, let's say, you put your eyes, you end, as soon as you can determine if it's a giraffe or a dog. Two options. So as soon as you can, you just put your hand up. And I will try to get in synchrony with that. So you're ready? Uh, Any hand. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah, no, that's not a cheat. 
No, no, no. Uh, well, oh, yeah, you can do that. That's a good thing. Yeah, left end for uh, giraffe and right end for dog. Yeah, right. That's, that's a good thing. <laughs> OK, ready? OK. So on average, I try to click in the middle. Everyone put the well left hand up. So you took like less than one second to do it. So I do it again. So you ready? Yeah. Almost the same. <laughs> OK. And now if I do it again, wait. So here was your answer quite fast. This is not a trick to, to attract your attention. I will do it one last time. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> some people put both ends up. That's not so far from true. Some are, took a bit more time. And actually, yeah, about the double than the previous one. Well, actually, when we do that, we measure it very precisely. Here, it's, yeah, I just click, so it's really not so, so precise. So what is usually thought about this? is that, well, what was measured, if you just take reaction times, for instance, in experimental psychology, is that you get, for non-ambiguous stimuli, some rapid answer. And on average, you go slower, slower for ambiguous stimuli. Of course, there is variation, because some people go faster, some hesitate less, and so on. But it doesn't tell you anything about the dynamics of the decision. So you just get an answer at the end. You know it's slower, but you don't know why. So it's totally compatible with the usual schema of having perception, cognition, and only action afterwards. You just take more time either for, for perceiving or for co cognition. But actually, there are other ways to measure this kind of dynamics. So one is using uh, one paradigm I like now. I got converted by a colleague, which is called the mouse tracker. So it records your movements with the mouse. So instead of just like putting the end up, but you could record that. It's easy to record mouse, mouse movements on the computer. So when you click on the start button, you get the stimuli appearing, and you have to move as fast as possible to one of the targets, so either the giraffe or the dog. And if you're really sure of you, you go almost straight. If you're really hesitating, you're deviating. Well, here I exaggerated a lot, <laughs> but usually you make, you can get big hesitation, so if you change your mind on the way, dynamically, you can see the thing going on the other direction. And then you have processing and analysis to, to study this. And so what this tells you is that actually, if you have constraints like going rapidly and interacting in real time, which happens for humans all the time and in robots as well, as soon as you start processing signals, you might have to do actions at the same time. So you need to update continuously, continuously your decisions based on what you get as information. So for instance, to give the time scale, it's often between 500 uh, milliseconds and one second to, to do the movement. So it's quite fast, and still you can see movements depending on what you perceive. Uh, yes, just to, so to show you how these kind of things are generated, so you can have this thing. Well, mm, no, too much distorted, so this way is fine. So you can morph easily these figures, which are from colleagues, into other things. So you can just easily adapt, I don't know, any, anything to, to make. Well, you can, you can control almost everything and measure the consequence it has on your decision and how you act. But additionally, you can also measure uh, eye, with eye trackers, the movement of the eyes, which inform you not this time on how you do the actions, which is kind of the action part of the end part in the classical view, but how you get information, so how you select what is important on the stimuli. So this is more to show that even on something that is very static, so you've already seen this in previous talks, uh, you need sometimes, well, to move the eyes between objects, but also on objects. So to recognize something, sometimes you need to focus on different things. For instance, for faces, it's known that people look at the eyes, nose, lips. So you, you have the eyes moving across uh, the face. And yeah, to illustrate this, so this is like, you can find this software for free if you're interested on the web from Freeman website. So mouse tracker is available. And for eye tracking, I love one experiment. So yes, then you can make like uh, well, density maps of where are you looking? And there is one nice experiment showing that as well, how dynamically your, also your actions with the eyes can inform and change your decisions. 
There is one nice study from Kitzman and at all, it's uh, from Koenigstim, Peter Koenigstim, uh, which show you this kind of picture. So I don't know if you know them, but something that makes you a mix between a face, uh, like a, a mouse, I think, there, and a mix of both. And you have the same with a seal, a donkey, and the mix of both. And depending on which one, not only you take decisions longer, but what happens as well is that depending on what you expect or how people can bias your saccades, you can perceive something different. So if it's unambiguous, for instance, you will look at the eye of the donkey and the head of the seal. But if it's something that is ambiguous, depending on what you see, depending on your interpretation, you will look differently. So this is exactly the same picture, but depending on how people process it, they look at different places. So, and this is done dynamically. So you can bias online and people can change your strategy. So you get this tight coupling between action and perception, even at the kind of millisecond timing. So this was kind of the introduction. So yes, just to show that this is not cheating. So you get this kind of, it, well, yeah, it will be stretched a lot on this screen. So yeah, maybe I, will, I won't put them in full screen. Uh, so you can use this experiment, I mean, of course, not like this, to measure like trajectories. Of course, it's not working here, I guess, because I connected to, I don't know. Well, so you can see the trajectory here. I try to go straight, but there is always a bias. And you can do programs simulating this behavior. So here, I'm not doing it. And the program is just doing the saccades and selecting the target, and you get exactly the same effect. So you can reproduce it in some simulations. Um, and here, I go back to my predictive aspects, because to guess what is one figure and what is another, you cannot rely only on just reacting to things and just switching from one point to another, but you need actually to make difference between two possibilities. And to make these differences, prediction is a good way, because you can predict, for instance, a long neck, you will check it. If it's not there, you can check something else and take decisions based on these predictions. So of course, I know, if you try to compare a cat and a giraffe, I guess checking the neck might be quite efficient. So that's one very efficient way to, to find differences. Okay. okay. Let's go back to more general stuff. So what I will be showing is, yeah, sorry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, when you're in this kind of task anyway, well, you can do also, we did some experiments when, with combined, for instance, targets. So already when you write giraffe and dog, of course, you bias two models, well, two models, two predictions you might have, and you only activate this one. You won't be looking for something else. So even if I'm, I know, yeah, displaying like before some curves at the bottom, it has no relevance because it's not in your, what you try to predict and what you try to, to do. Yeah? Well, actually, well, we show the stimuli when they click. So actually, there is no like stimuli occurring before. But what we do usually is yeah, computing saliency maps and um, saccade maps to contrast to see if stimuli are not more salient. Or, but for this ones, which is easy to predict, uh, all the points that are the endpoints are salient anyway. So, but for real stimuli, so we do experiments with real stimuli, we check this saliency stuff. Yeah, because yeah, it can make a huge difference for where you look. Yeah. You need a model at least to, yeah. If you have, if things could not be, do not have regularities, you won't be able to do any prediction. So yeah, you need some models or some thing, and then you, you bias these models depending on what you you perceive. So you contrast what you think might happen and what you observe. So yeah, there is yeah, and that's the kind of bias you can fi find easily in neural fields. So that's where the correct connection goes. So. Um, if you go to, well, I will present you many things on dynamical, let's say, decision making, and dynamic in the sense of things evolving fast. And so in this case, uh, 
you get this like retinal view and you can shift it around. And uh, we did several models, so two of them. One which is shown on the left, uh, so this makes connection with what Gregor said, uh, I think, on Tuesday, on using opfield network, for instance, where you get many attractors. So this is quite different to neural fields. But we did another model where you get uh, a dy dynamics which is based, well, it was based on neural fields, but for the reviewer, because there were too many things, they wanted us to make it simpler, so we went to more dynamical, just two neurons and so on connections. But initially, it was made with neural fields. Uh, so in this case, you have, and it will be the same in all these kind of models, you have the coupling between the predictors. So yeah, I will use that. Predictors, which are in inter interaction with <coughs> sensations. So in, for instance, here, Gabor filters to get orientation and angles and so on. And actions that go for either moving the mouse and moving the eyes. But uh, for when you have many, many predictions, you need to make, put them into competition to decide which one are the right one. And for this, either you can use this kind of neural inspired networks or you can use neural fields. <coughs> so it can be applied to various domains, so either motor control, categorization, which was shown before, and also I use it in more social psychology to see how stereotypes can affect the way you interact with people and with, of course, simulation, uh, with experiments. Uh, and you can use various models, so you can use neural networks, many different types, uh, classifiers, that was more my PhD work before, and uh, of course Bayesian models and uh, dynamic neural fields, which is our topic this week. Yeah. Okay. So, if you s get a broader perspective, usually you get signals from the environment, you can pre-process it. So this is more of a broad view of the kind of architecture that I'm using. Then you can make many predictions, depending on the context, on what you are seeing and what you expect. And then, at some point, you need to put them in competition. And that's where I use neural fields. So this is more a restricted use of neural fields that come like in combination with predictions. But for me, there are like two different roles. So one is going from very local activity to global, for instance, for planning. And the other one, for the neural field, is taking decisions and converging to one interpretation of the environment. So you might have 1,000 hypotheses, but in the end, when you act, you need to choose one. At least at each point in time. And you can revise it and choose another one afterwards. <coughs> OK, so that was a very long introduction. Uh, now I will, I don't know, maybe, yeah, let's see. Uh, so I did this kind of introduction. I could go rapidly through a kind of focus on why anticipation and prediction might be so important. So taking a kind of uh, phylogenetic view. So let's say that could be subtitles. So why bothering so much about prediction and how to embed it? Then how to do it with neural fields. So that's what we called uh, predictive neural fields. That was not my idea, uh, PNF. And uh, if you have many dimensions, which might happen quite fast with many predictions, uh, how you can handle it in neural fields. So this is another perspective on how to handle many dimensions in neural fields. And uh, because I have a kind of broad background, uh, the first one was more on the psychological and modeling experiments. Uh, now we can turn to the, the more philosophical and phylogenetical section. And then there is a pure neural dynamics, and the last one is more mathematical. So if you're tired at, at the end of the talk, that's maybe not the best choice, but yeah, it's easy to understand at the end. Um, yeah, so if I go to this, uh, so I went yeah, through several labs interested in theoretical biology and philosophical aspects of evolution of uh, living beings. So I commit, let's say, that's what you can find in all the slides, to like the dynamical like, system view on living beings where you have far from equilibrium dynamical systems that interact with the environment and they need to be self-maintaining to not, for instance, die or fall apart and so on. So this is quite compatible depending on the, well, on the community with robots or some of them are saying it's not, but I think it is. So I won't go into these details, but at some point uh, you have what is called by some people uh, implicit anticipation. So this is things you don't think as prediction or anticipation usually, but for instance, if you take, this is not the best example, but let's say a tree in interaction with the environment, uh, and not like I will show here the cycle of day and night, but you can take the cycle of the whole year. 
Usually, when the tree uh, grows leaves, it costs a lot of energy. And in autumn, you might say, oh, but it's just by itself cutting connections with the leaves, and the leaves are falling quite easily with the wind. So it might seem quite costly, even if the sun could still bring a lot of energy during autumn. But since this process is very, very long, it reacts to some early signals, because in winter, if it keeps its leaves li alive and there, are, there is a lot of snow, it might break the branches and so on. So th the tree, by selection through evolution, react to some signals very early to have good consequences months and months later. So this is something that is called this uh, implicit anticipation. So actually it's because if, so someone talked about this before, I forgot, but if everything, yeah, I think it was Julia yesterday, yes, if everything was chaotic in the environment, you couldn't predict anything. So you need some regularities in it. So of course there are regularities, like cycles in nature and so on. And so in this case, if you have a cycle, you can do this kind of implicit predictions and act accordingly, not when it's too late, but much earlier. And so if you're in synchrony, no problem, you will leave. But if you, oh, yeah. So if you're just out of synchrony, so like, yeah, being awake when it's night and again, sleeping when it's day, for us, it might be fine for some time, but for plants, it would not work this way. I mean, the exchanges have to be in some order. And so in this case, you're eliminated by selection. Same for other organisms. So this is a classical, well, in kind of bi theoretical biology, I use it quite often, the swim and tumble behavior of bacteria. So bacteria, or this type, the E. coli, the one that is <laughs> giving you some very odd moment sometimes uh, for gastroenteritis, I think. Um, as a behavior, which is if it was always going in a straight line, for instance, just swimming randomly, it will go sometimes in sugar, which is represented in blue, or out of sugar and then dying. So there is a very simple behavior. So if it's just going randomly, it dies again. But there is one behavior, which is the swim and tumble. So this is when sugar goes down, it just turns around totally randomly. So you get all the flagella going around. I just choose a run, um, direction randomly and then goes again. And what is this implicit prediction is that there is a connection between the density of sugar and how much it turns around, or how much, how often, let's say. So if you have low sugar, it will say, oh, this is not the right place, or randomly going away. But if there is sugar, it will just go on. So this is one way, stochast stochastically, to do actions at some point, because you know there will be a reward like getting sugar much later. So again, this is another way of choosing these actions. Well, and to finish, finish with that, uh, then you need what is explicit anticipation. So when the world becomes really complex, having many, many animals around, having many actions, then everything becomes dynamic, and then you need to represent things that might be predicted. Because you cannot predict everything, you will just learn what is useful for your life, let's say. I have almost finished with the childish section, then it's finished. <laughs> um, just to, because it will have consequences on how I implement this prediction on neural fields. So the last point is that this might be compatible with having reflexes, so some reaction to the environment that has been selected for evolution. For instance, even if you don't know what a frog is because you see something dark and big, you might react, well, if you're not reacting, you die again, but you might have reflexes that make you react to changes. So this might be the behavior selected by evolution, but then if you get learning, what you might do is the next time you come here, you make an association with the frog and not with the tongue and go away as fast as possible. So you need to have predictive mechanisms that are built on top of reflexes and both are working together. So you do the learning based on the constraints given by evolution and these reflexes. So I will show it in your fields.
that measurement uh, couples the computer system and uh, because uh, velocity in some physical sense is uh, yeah. anticipatory, you know, it's, it's, the root of, it's the rate of change, then uh, if you couple uh, that signal to the motor system, then it will be able to bring about some change earlier. Yeah. That seems to me a very weak kind of yeah. prediction. While uh, you seem to have in your models Right. Well, I, I will totally agree. I mean, the, when I present this implicit versus explicit anticipation, the implicit one is well debated because it's really, really weak indeed. I mean, you can put it almost everywhere. Well, there are some very specific criteria to select what is implicit anticipation or not. As long as you have something you sense that is not directly related to what you will do later, this can be some form of implicit anticipation, as long as you do reaction before uh, the last time. Um, but actually, yes, what I'm more interested in, but this could only develop with brains and learning systems, is these explicit anticipations, where you really need to build this prediction and then dis differentiate them, and then yeah, take actions based on this differentiation. So I will, yeah, definitely, I think only the second part is really, I mean, what we as humans consider as predictive or anticipatory, but in the literature, there are plenty of yeah, papers and discussions about these implicit, explicit distinctions. I think what this brings is just explaining how you can go from this very broad definition to something much more, yeah, let's say, cognitive, which is more the explicit form that you have. I don't know if it's, yeah. Um, yep. So, to sum, sum it up, so yes, it can be, I could have shown this slide, it could be could have been more efficient. Uh, so with anticipation, what you can do is like eliminate some lag or delay you have in your senses. So like the time delays you have in your body, so you can integrate them. So this is fine with the implicit one. You need to have anticipation build up on top of reflexes. And then, which is yeah, the more important thing, uh, predictions have something that is called normative value. So it's normative for the agent because by itself, without any knowledge from the outside, it can detect what is right and what is wrong. Because it's not just a state that you can just observe, but you are doing an action and doing a prediction. So it's like in science, usually you do hypothesis, experiments to test them, and you check your predictions. So this is the same way of doing that, but in any kind of anticipatory system. So this is called, uh, at least in philosophy, having epistemic contact in, with the environment. So it means that you get in contact with a way of yeah, testing your representation. So the representation you have is not just within your brain, but has only senses when it's connected with the environment. And a good uh, thing is that it can then filter out noise and destructing things, because you can predict something, and if something is not predicted or not in your model, either you learn it or you can just dismiss it. Um, and finally, what you can get with it is more like the goal directedness that was discussed before. You can get coordination between predictions, so chaining, for instance, mechanism to make planning. Uh, and it will as well abstracting, so for instance, if you take the hierarchical temporal memory model, which is uh, more from the US, you get this kind of building up of from predictions, building up objects and things that have <coughs> regularities within it. And if you go even more abstract, uh, you go to like uh, things like uh, Mark Bicard's interactivism, where you can get any concept or object defined as a network of well potentialities, so potential interaction around this object. So it's kind of classical stuff, but a bit changed. Like I don't know, uh, yeah, let's let's take this. <laughs> so you can define this not just by its shape, by some state, but by the actions you can do. So you expect it to be graspable, to be moving quite easily, and to be quite precise when you point. So this is, uh, I don't know how you call it, <laughs> but yeah, this is this object, even if it doesn't a name, because of all these properties and stabilities it has. And if you break it, 
it's no more this object because it loses these interactions. So that's a way to get stable concepts. And which is more the link with uh, this quick talk, uh, it's easy to distribute and kind of neurally plausible, at least in the cortex, this predictive mechanism between cortical columns, for instance. Okay, so switching to the third part. So let's go deep into the neural dynamics and how you can, you can embed prediction in it. So, uh, until now, from what, uh, what we've seen, at least in the courses this week, you know, if I'm not wrong, correct me, if I miss something on Monday, except yes, maybe Monday's courses, uh, if you have static input, you've seen how to make decision selection and all these things. If you have moving stuff, uh, I will go directly, uh, I have the video here, but I think I will go directly for simulation, I will try to. So, let's say you have, for instance, two inputs, Gaussian again, because it's easy to match with the kernels and it works well, uh, with a lot of noise here, about 50% yeah, noise. Uh, you can just run simulation and you will get your instability and selection of one peak here. Okay, this is classical. But here, in this case, you have moving inputs. So they are turning around. And the dynamics, because you have the shift uh, Gregor showed as well. If you move a bit the input, it will, the attractor will just follow the, well, it will adapt to this change in the input dynamics. So you can do tracking with this kind of thing. It's quite robust. So if you add, as I said, uh, even destructors, it can still kind of work, even if it's become hard sometimes even for us. So it can still track one input and not the other one, and at some point it might lose it. I hope so. But you see that there is a lot of noise in the dynamics because of this, yeah, there is too much noise everywhere. So let's say, let's push it more. Yeah, okay. <laughs> at some point it dis it's dismissed, and well, if you just start with this, you're not able to find anything. So it's really unstable. Well, why it's flashing is because you get a huge activation and then inhibition, activation, inhibition, so. But again, if you just make the task easier, again, it focuses and selects one, one target. But actually, if you, as human, know the trajectory of the thing or learned it and try to focus on it and track it, I mean, you can do it with very, very adverse condition. Even if it's really, really hard, you will do it. So. To put this in slides, so I will skip this. Yeah, no video. Okay. So with it, with the classical equation, and uh, let's say the well, I don't use the exactly the same kernel, but it doesn't make much difference. Here it's a difference of Gaussian, and so instead of having global inhibition with constant value, I just use a, a standard deviation which is smaller. So if you want the exact kernel that was shown before, you just put the small b to infinity, and you get exactly the same one. So it's not so different. So you get mechanism like selection, what was already shown, and to make the bridge with uh, robotics, for instance, even if you have two inputs that are quite similar, it can be like running into some obstacle, like you have a robot going this direction. You have one obstacle in the middle and two possibilities, going left or going right. In this case, you want to select, even if they have exactly the same probability, so that's where I will disagree with Alexander yesterday. If two things have exactly the same probability, sometimes you really need to decide which one is a good one. So in this case, either going left or going right. So this is working well with the standard equation. Uh, same, you have this kind of interpolating uh, capability. So if you have two activities very close by, the neural field will just merge them to get a peak in the middle. So this is very useful for generalization, for instance. So if you're in the middle of a field with, without any obstacle and you have different directions possible, it's instead of just zigzagging, you can just go straight. That's the other possibility. Again, focusing. So once you've selected something, you're really robust to keep it in track, so either for attention or for decisions. So in this case, once you're moving in one direction, for those who do robotics, you don't want jitter because of the command, like doing, giving commands in many directions, and the robot in general doesn't like that much. And finally, if you have a lot of noise, which is kind of usual, uh, you want to have something that sto stochastically can select uh, efficiently one action and be stable on it. However, if you look, yeah, I will go back here. If you look at the equation and you are doing 
differential equation math, uh, you see that this, this equation is like stationary. You, you, stationary in English? Yeah. you assume that the input will not be moving. So if the input is moving, what you could observe, actually, I should have shown it on the simulation, is like you get oscillations for the bubble. So actually, you have the stimulus, which is moving. You have your focus, that is your peak that appeared before, below. And once it's moving, you get the focus that is not moving because it's assumed not to be moving. Then the stimulus moves too far away. It goes down and up and down, and you get these oscillations when tracking. So if you're going slow, as you've seen before, the attractor will just adapt to it. If things move faster, it's not working anymore because we'll just lose the attractor and try to go back to the other one. And if you add noise on top of it, you will just lose the attractor, and that's the end. So what's not working? Not working, depending on what you try to do, of course. <laughs> In this case, it's for tracking, so this is important. But for I know decisions from static images, it doesn't make much a difference. So if you have, let's say, a distractor, so something, let's say you're in a street, you have plenty of cars, and you try to track a car going in front or below, uh, behind other cars. If it goes behind another car, which is quite similar, we don't have any problem. In general, we will expect the car to go on the other side. But with this system, it will just be struck on the other car. It will just take the thing that is the most static one. So what happens is that you have this kind of behavior. So you track, and you stop on anything that's not moving. If you have occlusions, same thing. You lose your input, and except if you're able to keep the peak, but it will not be moving, you will have your peak disappearing and reappearing somewhere else. And finally, if you have things moving too fast, you either get this kind of flashing behavior, where you have the attractor building up and down and up and down, or nothing at all, because you're not able to converge on a solution. And what you might expect, at least for tracking, is like, what we can do quite easily, track something that is moving a circle, um, track something even if there is occlusion. So we just expect it to go on the other side. And of course, if it goes fast, being able to track it all the time. So if we go back to the equation, how to do that? So that's kind of an open question. What you do say? I know. Anyone has an idea on how to? change the equation or do something on it or add something so that you can go from this behavior to this one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's one solution. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So one solution is indeed to change the kernel. So if you don't add the kernel which is centered, which means that it assumes the focus will stay in place, you can have asymmetric kernels. And then you shift the kernel on, for instance, one side, and it will mean the, there will be movement all the time. So this is, well, you quite, quite, quite easily test it with the classical neural fields. You just shift the kernel on one side, and you will see that the, the peak building are shifting all the time on the side you decided. So that's quite easy. However, uh, I cited one, well, one person that did this uh, for tracking movement, for instance. But there are many other implementations of these asymmetric kernels. Uh, but then. If you have many, many predictions, which might happen, then you need to have either one kernel per prediction to shift, for instance, in one direction, or you need to merge kernels. However, if you merge kernels, uh, either dynamically it can be quite expensive, and if you do it statically, it means that you will have kernels that become really strange rapidly and not so much working anymore, because you get excitation all the way, inhibition all the way, it's not working so well. Uh, and also, depending on the trajectory, if you're expecting like some movement all the same everywhere, no problem, you have one kernel the same for every point. But if you have like a complex trajectory in your field, you might need one kernel per place. So this is quite complex again. And uh, for learning these kernels at each point, it might be again quite complex. And if you bias the kernel, what is quite harder is to keep the properties. So you still want to have selection, you still want to have robustness, and this is not so, so easy. Second solution is to bias uh, the U here. So you can put the prediction in there. But since uh, the two of them are quite coupled, you get almost the same problems. And finally, which is not a perfect solution, but this is the one I chose, is to bias like the input. So instead of just considering the stimulation as something from the environment or from the stimulation, you can add things like 
bottom-up information, giving you what's the state in the environment, and top-down projections you make. So predicting what might happen. And what you want to have is these two projections that are matching. So if they are matching, it means you're observing what you predict, so your, your predictions are right. OK, you follow me until this point? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Why? It doesn't do it completely because, well, at some point I was looking at this and we tried with uh, velocity detectors because I use also the saliency maps with velocity, for instance, as input. So it helps a lot because it does this yeah, derivation thing directly. Uh, but actually, when you're looking, I, I don't remember the references ex exactly, but there were some references showing that even in, well, it was in humans, but for perception, we are able as well to perceive like acceleration quite easily. So if something accelerates, we are able to do it as well. Yeah, but then it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but then, I mean, we, well, initially we were looking at something that could be plausible in, not only for this, but on also for projecting other things. Not only movement, this is for tracking, but it can apply to, what I apply it to, for instance, is predicting uh, configuration on the body and so on. And in this case, it's not really derivation, but just projection of what you expect to grasp or to touch and so on. So it can have different roles. So this one was satisfying all these needs, whereas the other one is, I guess, better for getting input, which is efficient for tracking and vision, but not for other, other tasks. So You're still going to elaborate, right? No, yeah, I, I won't be going into the grasping and stuff, but I will elaborate on the more on the vision example. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so actually what I do is like, instead of having only the input from the environment, it's combining uh, this S, which is a stimulation, with a prediction, the P, which is a prediction from uh, what you are currently perceiving. So let's say this will be S, the sensor input, the U will be the perception, and the P will be the prediction. So you want your perception, U, to integrate both your sensors and your predictions. So, in practice, if you take neural fields, as usual, uh, you remember, well, um, so you take, at some point, any point in time, uh, t, you have your, well, what I call focus here because it was on tracking, but let's say the activity field, right, or the, yeah, the u, uh, which has, for instance, two peaks building, so not one of them one on the other one, so they are competing, and you can make prediction. So, for instance, if your prediction is like, uh, these peaks should be, well, or why I'm, what I'm watching is moving in one direction. I can expect them to move there, so at the next time, I will be expecting them to be shifted in the field. At the same time, you're still working with the standard equation, so you compute the integral, so the sum over all uh, units with the kernel, so you get this kind of global inhibition, but for your two peaks. You get your stimulation, and for instance, if you have only one input which is moving accordingly to your prediction, this one will be corresponding to uh, the top one, sorry, and this one might be moving, for instance, down left, so not accordingly to your prediction. And when you put everything together in the equation, so when you do the sum in the equation, you get this kind of thing. So this one, this one which moved a bit, and this one are kind of related, so it will activate this peak more than this one, which is only activated by the focus and not too much inhibited by this one. So you get a bias, which makes a stronger activation for things satisfying your prediction. Yeah, yeah, right. Sorry? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah, that's yeah. Um, 
Yeah, actually, yeah, it's uh, like you need what I won't explain here, but you can have totally different time steps for the simulation and your prediction. So you can predict, for instance, things that will happen in one second. So it's a derivation with one second time step uh, relatively to the simulation that might require, I don't know, 50 iterations per second. So indeed, this, this is an approximation on the yeah, trajectories of derivative, actually. Yeah. What I, yeah. So if you take the limit and reduce the, um, yeah, the time step, you indeed go to the derivative. Right. Did I answer to, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you mean this one and? Oh, no, no, there is no error between them. Well, this well should not really be displayed just to show how you can compute the equation, let's say, computationally when you're on a computer, the different steps you can do. So this is like the convolution, so the integral. So just compute this thing from here. So it's, this is what makes you, makes the competition between the two peaks. So one might be winning, but if you have only this, and no prediction and, and no stimulation, you will just have one focus and, and it will just decay. But then you add the stimulation and with the classical uh, equation, you have, for instance, one thing here with your current competition that will just reinforce each other. And here I just add one more bias, which is to say, okay, between these two peaks competing, I can add the bias toward one of them. And in this case, it's only the very top uh, peak that helps to to confirm that this one is actually moving in this direction. So in the end, when you <coughs> iterate this process, you converge onto only one, and the one you converge on, you force the decision to go on the one you predicted well. So it's one way to converge on predictions. Then to test it, I will go quickly through it. Yeah, should go quickly. Um, so you give inputs to the model with noise and so on. Um, you make the model run, and then as an observer to test the model, at least correctly, you just um, well make some hypothesis. So in our case, because we're interested in tracking, we want only one yeah, iCat bubble. I tried to convert them all to peaks, but yeah, the two are quite equivalent, I guess, terms. So you get only one peak appearing. That's what you suppose. You can compute the center of mass of this peak and compare the position here with the position of the input, the one you know as a designer, but of course the system doesn't know. So this is one, one way to evaluate the system, if it's right or wrong, working well or not. And you check if you obtain the properties you expect. And so you compute one error at every time step. How far are you from the tracking you want to, to achieve? And so you can test different scenarios, like yeah, alternation with moving stimuli. You can test with destructors. With, you can take with, test with noise and uh, also specific to prediction, so things not working at all with the classical uh, equation, things with destructors not moving, and with occlusions. And actually, what you get is something that works better on average, so except for when you have alternation, because once you try to, you start to focus on something, you expect it moving, so even if it starts disappearing, you will go on having your prediction active. So we'll, you will go on predicting the movement even if you don't see it anymore. So that's one drawback. That since you have predictions, like I know, you're really expecting something to happen, you will look at it more, so you will spend more time looking for it. So the drawback is that you are less reactive. So, so here you can see it here. So if you have no predictions when there is a change in attractor, you're quite fast to react. If you have a right prediction, you will be much slower. And if, uh, so this is, yeah, the dashed line in the onset of the change. So if you have a change at this point, with the classical equation, you change here. With the right predictor, you change here. And what is interesting is that even with the wrong predictor, so something predicting something not happening, you can still have a switch here. So it's still working, even if the prediction is totally wrong. Uh, you have the same with the destructor, so you see that the classical equation and the wrong predictor just go up, so the error just increases uh, well, to infinite if you lose it, and if it's a straight trajectory. And for occlusion, you lose the thing and you get it uh, with the wrong predictor. Um, you lose it more, at least uh, at some point, pop. you lose it with, um, with no prediction, so here 
the occlusion starts, you lose your target and you get it back when it goes on the other side. Whereas for the prediction, when it's correct, it's of course you start to losing it because you don't have stimulation, you, so you're like, oh, it might be disappearing, but if you get it soon enough, you get it back and you're able to track it. And so on average, uh, you have the error from the standard version to the other one that goes down. And even if you increase the noise up to a very high level, which is quite useful for perception or robotics, you can still see that the tracking remains quite good and much lower than the classical equation. But it doesn't go down to zero. So this was a trick I, I've hidden. So actually, if you use the equation and just change the stimulation to something that is shifted, uh, the focus to something shifted, so you have only one prediction. So for instance, if you expect something moving in a straight line, you can learn these things, but here I'm cheating by just giving the, the velocity directly. So this answers to Gregor's question. You find the velocity multiplied by delta t in it. So you have a shift. You expect this shift. Uh, this means that you will get a activities at the ear. So you get your current focus with a strong uh, activation because you have the decay which gives some properties to the equation. You have your stimulation and you have your predictions. However, if you compute the sum, weighted sum of all these things, you know that the result will always be between this position and this position. So this means that the peak that will be built will never be exactly on this but will always be lagging behind. So that's why the error is never dropping to zero. So for this, there are many ways to do it. One way that's working is to just overshoot. So you must differentiate two types of, well, it's no more prediction. So one is your prediction, which is exactly what is written on top. So what you expect to observe, but you have another, not prediction, but action you must have on the equation to observe this thing. So you must differentiate what you observe and what you do. It's the same in the motor systems between the commands you send to muscles and what you expect as a return. Depending on the context, it might be totally different. So in this case, the solution is just to, here it's really exaggerated, but you can just shift your prediction. So in the end, when you combine your prediction, the stimulation and the focus, you manage to align your prediction with uh, your, your focus with your prediction. So this is one way to reduce lag to zero. But yeah. So I mean, I think the main lesson from this is that when you have dynamical systems with complex interactions, it's not just like you can take some very easy computation, just put it in the equation, and it will work like this. I mean, you need to take into account all the feedbacks, the interaction, and all this stuff, which makes the dynamics a bit more complex. So you do something like this. So you have what you aim to observe and what you have to do in the equation, so what you add as a term, which is a shifted one, which is increased by uh, a constant, multiplicative constant that makes the peak shift more. So I did some math on this to find the right parameters, but actually if you have a learning system, you will directly learn what action you will do, so the gamma v and the v directly. So this thing should be learned in a full system. Yeah, so this was a bit complex, but on the average, I mean, the general thing, you understood how it works? Yeah. Yeah. So you talk about the shift is, uh, yeah. When you talk about using a learning system, because uh, this uh, shift of prediction is not, uh, it might not be deterministic. Like in, in a dynamic environment, sometimes it might shift less, sometimes your prediction might take uh, maybe more for your action. Yeah, but again, yeah, if your environment, well, let's say, Um, yeah, it's the same for movement, but I know you have many like commands like this, but if you have one that you're seeing at one point, you might do learning on this one. So there will be regularities quite well. If you take another one, we'll have different regularities, but globally, the kind of interaction and prediction you can make are quite similar. So in this case, you will have two sets of predictors, which of course are different, so you have stochastic uh, variations between them. And this brings us then to the next step when you have many predictors. But actually, I mean, in one configuration or one movement, yeah, if everything is moving all the time, you cannot predict anything anyway. So you need some regularities at least at some point in time to, to learn it. But it can change afterwards. So the, the shift is based on all these uh, regularities? Yeah. yeah. Yes. 
Uh, no, because, well, if you actually, that uh, the prediction you added to the field where, well, let's say, you're currently trying, for instance, to compute for this point at the next iteration. So at this point, you want to have, of course, the focus before, which was almost no, add the stimulation, which is I, but not add, um, let's say, yeah, I represented it a bad way, but well, well, when I should put it, yeah, here, I guess. If you're here, at this point, actually that's where you want to build up the peak because you want to shift it this way. So if you want to build up this peak, so position X is here, actually if the stimulus is moving this way, you want to get activity from this point. So that's why there is a minus. So you need to revert the predictions. X is the position, but you're computing at T plus, yeah, T plus something, so yeah. Yeah, right, yeah, I, sh I should have told it. Yeah. Told it. Um, okay, so on average, what you get is for all the scenarios, when you get a prediction, you get better results, except for the first one. And if you wonder why, for instance, for destructors, it's even better with a wrong prediction, this is not statistically significant. So it's not magical, it's just, uh, kind of statistical effect that, yeah, you have a difference, but it's not meaningful. So usually when you have a bad prediction, results are not so good, but it's still working. So you're still able to do your task, even if your prediction is wrong. So that's a good thing. So you can have reflexive behavior, try predictions. If they are right, you keep them. If they are wrong, you just fall back onto the reactive behavior. So you still keep the properties, even if you make bad, pr bad predictions. So this is quite important to learning. So to sum it up, uh, so you get the original properties and you add new ones, like for occlusions, uh, distractors. You get a lower error for tracking, so or tracking or let's say shifting rapidly to things moving. And you can always fall back to the standard version. However, this is linked to the previous question. Uh, if you have some arbitrary trajectory or many different possibilities, you still need to switch between different predictors. So how you do that? So again, you take the same equation, but instead of having one predictor, what you want to have is more generalization. So in some conditions, you might have some trajectory appearing, and in other conditions, you might have a totally different trajectory. So you need to make the difference between them online. It's not that one is always incorrect and one always correct. You just need to adapt online to what you observe. So what you have is that if your prediction is too fast compared to what you observe, you will get something like this. You have your prediction always in front, which is not useful. If you have two predictions, one is right, one is wrong, you want to select, not keep both peaks active. So actually what you want is more something that is a combination of all the predictors and that are weighted dynamically. So if you see your prediction is right, you keep it. If you see it's wrong, you just diminish it. And this is quite easy to do because at all times you can check your predictions so you know which ones are right and which ones are not right. So it means you can do this kind of things, so you have two predictions, one disappears and one is kept. If you have two predictions with two speeds quite similar, you can interpolate between them because you use the neural field dynamics. So you get all the classical properties also for several predictors. Yeah? Yeah, so if you only keep one, for instance, if you make a winner-take-all uh, thing, then if, for instance, that was the question before. If you have one speed at some point which is slow and one over which is fast, and then you want to generalize, if you take only the best one, you're, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but if you get one with that you never seen, but which is just a combination on an intermediate value between the other ones, you still need to interpolate them. For instance, yeah. Again, I, I know. You've seen this command, which is small. Uh, you have a big one. Then, I mean, if you give any other one which is intermediate, you might work with it because you know how it works for both of them. So you can distort your predictions for working with that. And, of course, because here we have the neural field dynamics, you get all these properties of interpolating and so on directly in the field. So why not 
making use of it. It's already there, it's working, so let's use it. So again, same process. Uh, you compute several predictions this time, so you get several projections of what you might observe. You combine them with the competition, with the stimulation, and you get uh, an approximation of all possible things you might have. And here, that's where you put the weights. But the weights, how you obtain them, so that's quite easy as well. So you get your focus at any time, and once you focus on something, you will check at the next uh, time what was, well, sorry, the focus since it integrates the stimulation, you have a bias towards what is observed, so you can select which predictions are right and which predictions are wrong. So you can diminish the weight here of those who are wrong and keep the ones who are right. And you can do that at every time step, so dynamically you can switch between predictions. So let's say you have something, you have only predictions of things moving in straight line, or let's say more in the visual cortex, you have predictions for speed, uh, for instance, empty cells in eight different directions. And so you can have only this eight direction, and dynamically the activity will switch between the different predictors. You can reproduce that, so here again it's directly coded in the brain, but you can reproduce that easily with, with this. So you get the same thing, you get a fast selection between predictors and what you can observe is that you have several predictors, for instance, centered at different speed here and what is represented in blue is the tuning curves. So you have each predictor sensitive to different range of speeds and if you have many, they will just overlap like receptive fields in, in vision and will ju you will just cover all possible speeds. So you're able, able to track any speed even if you have actually only one, two, three, four, five predictors. With five predictors, you are able to track anything between, for instance, eight, I don't know what was the unit, but eight uh, radian per second or something, and 16 radian per second. So you don't need to cover the all possibilities. You can only keep a few predictions and use the neural fields to just make the interpolation, regression, let's say, between predictors. Okay, questions until now? That's a lot, I think, but <laughs> okay. And uh, last, so yeah, I, maybe this makes a connection with, I think it was again Gregor who talked about this, about the hyperacuity that you can get. So you can get it statistica, stat statically with neural fields, with each, each point being sensitive to large receptive fields, and then using the peaks to interpolate between them. But you can use it as well for having hyperacuity for predictions. So if you predict different speeds, you can interpolate. If you predict different direction, you interpolate. If you predict different trajectories, you can interpolate as well dynamically. So you don't need to learn many, many examples. You can just learn like a few and interpolate between them. So that's much more efficient for learning. Yep. It's funny that you make the connection between Bayesian filters because yeah, yeah, yesterday you had the connection between the neural fields and Bayesian way of doing that. But actually I did one thing to select predictions, which is you just generate some predictors and based on this feedback, you can estimate the weight. So let's say you have a population of particles, which are your predictors, and the feedback gives you the weight. The one which are the best one, you can again differentiate them to refine your predictions. So that's the way of learning these things. You just generate predictions select the best one, differentiate, select the best one. So it's more the immunitary algorithms that I use for that. Mm -hmm. And so you get some behavior which is very close to particle filter, you rapidly converge to the right prediction. So it's one way to do learning in this stuff. So. You can, you can resample, that's what I was telling. Uh, you can do exactly the same, but you can separate totally the predictive parts, that's how you generate them, and the dynamic neural field. You just inject them in it. So what you can do with, well, it was artificial again because just, it was just generating different speeds, but what I tried is using kind of 
particle filtering using the neural fields to make the selection. So you get the weight of the particles, and then you resample around the, the, new, the good particles. So you can get exactly the same dynamic as the particle filtering with this. But you need to generate new predictions at every time step or every few time steps. So let's say here I use fixed prediction not to make it more complex, but you can use predictions that evolve in time. OK. So last step for this predictive thing. Yeah. Um, so we talked a lot about this prediction and dynamics in the covert way, so with a fixed view. But I totally dismissed the overt part, so the thing about moving the eyes. So finally, what you can do is just merging the two of them. So I'll, I think, run the video. So trying to explain it. Um, so on the top, you have, uh, let's say, an uh, allocentric view on the, of the environment, where the small rectangle is the artificial retinal field that you move around. So you can move it to track the target. And the small red thing is the thing you want to track. So here is the um, well, allocentric view. This is more the egocentric view. So that's what the agent is seeing. That's the only input he has. So seeing something going through the field. So initially, whoop, it's just crossing. And then you try to follow it. So this is with the pure reactive uh, dynamics, so no prediction. Um, so you see that there is no movement prediction here. The only thing that you can add to the system is predicting how you move. So when you make a saccade, you know that you will, you will be shifting the eyes. So that's quite similar to the looking archi architecture you've been seeing before. You can predict how much the stimulation will move in your field of view. So if you have one stimulus here and you predict it to move down, when you make the saccade here, you can predict everything else will be moving the other direction. Um, and so in this case, what you can observe is that the system by default loses the target. That's what I shown before. So you need saccades to compensate the movement. So this is what is observed in Macake Monkeys, for instance, when you do something moving fast and they are not trained to it. They are just saccading on it, losing it, saccading, losing it, saccading. So you have what is called saccades, which are far away, and what is called catch-up saccades. So when something is moving, you get small saccades just behind the target. You get this behavior, exactly this one, where you lacking, lagging, saccading, lagging, saccading, and so on. OK. And here is a count. So you can see that here, for instance, there are many, many saccades. So everyone, there is a peak. Every, each time there is a peak, it means that the system is just saccading and not making a smooth movement. So, OK. <coughs> if I go to the next step. OK, sorry, here. So this is after one or two runs. Uh, you can have an estimate of how far uh, you were from your target. So you can measure how far from the center the target was using the focus. So if you're lagging behind, you just need to compute the center of mass to know how far you were behind it. Estimate the speed, and you just use it for making the prediction. And so what you observe, at the beginning, you will just saccade on it. But rapidly, since you can select the right prediction, you can just, or even have one prediction in this case, you can just follow it smoothly. So you get only a few saccades at the beginning, like four to five, and then you're just smoothing, smoothly, smoothly sorry, following the target. So this is what is observed in monkeys when they train on some stimuli. If it's moving fast, they learn to track it, and they don't make any saccades afterwards. Uh, this, this one, you mean? The prediction for the movement? Because it's centered in the yeah. Yeah. If you try. Exactly. Yeah. So it is really, I would say, that is really the indiscriminate projection of velocity. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's how you can easily estimate velocity from here when you, you have the prediction. You, you know how much it's centered, so you can estimate velocity. And I guess that's the reason why, with Yulia, we should plug in this directly in the architecture for looking, because yeah, that's quite compatible with your system for choosing for saccades and for generating saccades, where here it's totally artificial. It's just I look how much it's eccentered, evaluate speed, and, and do that. But it's, yeah. Just like you said, you know, I only have some experimental connections. Uh, a lot of people are using the catch up the card yeah. to measure the motion perception. Yeah.
it seems to me that you're in this wrong position and then you're sampling somehow and then put in there, but and there's more protection there. Yeah. Protection yeah. That's yeah, that should be. Yeah. yeah, get that. Well, actually, this was more done with uh, more experimental neuroscientists with monkeys that really wonder how we could switch so smoothly between something that is saccadic, and then in the middle, what the monkeys do is switching between saccade and smooth movement, and they were wondering if there was an explanation using neural fields, for instance, to explain how you could have a very smooth transition from this saccades to smooth movement. Even if it's well known that there are the two behaviors, uh, what they are struggling on is that are there two different systems, or is it one system and you just see like the behavior as an emergent of the, the system? You're less concerned with how that signal comes out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so the final slide on this. Yeah. So you take the architecture from before, you just couple it with, uh, let's say here, a pen tilt camera if you're in robotics, or a monkey if you think it's a good model of the brain, which of course, I guess it isn't. Um, and what you do is that in addition to just tracking your target, you can from this estimate indeed the immediate velocity, so see how much eccentered it is, so how much you're lagging behind it, and use this for generating eye movements. So you have threshold uh, in neurons to generate these eye movements. So if it's, uh, after some time, well, some time delay, you can generate the saccade and try to catch up this, this thing. So you send this command to the robot or to the eye, let's say, to, to make the movement. And at the same time, of course, because you're making the movement, you need to predict the change due to the movement. So you have one more prediction that is required, which is this time the prediction you make from your own eye movement. Okay? So you have two things moving. So in contrary to what was presen previously presented, if you have the environment moving, you need to predict how it's moving in the environment, but also need to predict what your actions are doing. And actually, if you're tracking perfectly, your eye movements should exactly compensate the movement outside. So what you obtain is that the prediction here and the prediction here are opposite. So instead of having all this overshoot stuff, which makes things more complex and less natural, if you have actions in your tracking behavior, what you can simply do, yeah, instead of doing this overshooting, is just having inhibition where you were. You do the same for this one, and the two of them will exactly compensate. So that's what you can see. Uh, I will put the video again, I guess. What you can see here, uh, Initially, it's not the case, so I will wait for the beginning. You have the prediction, uh, which is this way, and this one, which is different. It goes too fast, so it's hard to see. But as soon as you start to track it, you see that this one becomes centered with inhibition excitation, and this one with excitation inhibition. Because one is expecting you move, so the stimulus should go in one direction. But since you know the stimulus is moving, you expect also the other direction. So the stable attractor is something that is static in the middle of the field. So it's centration behavior. So you, you foveate the target and you track it. So you need these two predictions. OK? And that was the end for this, this part. Uh, so yeah. I guess, yeah, just for the conclusion, so you, you have the dynamic neural fields that are really good for tracking with robustness and so on. You can add other behavior to it. You don't need a complex extension. You just add. Uh, these inputs that bias the dynamics, and you can get these this nice, at least, interactions. And it's very compatible with learning methods, since you have a direct measure of how good your representations are. And that's it for that. And since it's uh, maybe <coughs> late, I think, maybe I should stop here and not present the last part. Or. But I can go maybe quickly through the beginning and just stop at the beginning. So yeah, I, I guess did not size the presentation correctly. So for, yeah, so the last part is about more, let's say, math. So how to apply these neural fields with many dimensions. So, okay, if we go back here, okay, I say it's compatible with learning method. I've shown the results with tracking, so with two dimensions. But actually, if I use it with, uh, let's say, configuration of uh, a body or robot or anything, you might have many dimensions. 
And sometimes you might be able to restrict these things to two dimensions or three dimensions, but sometimes you might not. So actually, what is, well, you have the classical model, so uh, things that you've seen already a lot, so I can skip this. You have the equation, and in many models, so you have always uh, the same parameters, like the kernel, uh, the sigmoid, for instance, function, uh, the kernel parameters, uh, resting level, and so on, which are common to different models. And you have different implementation of the model. So one using, for instance, uh, so yeah, I was talking about this one because this is the one I used during my postdoc, but of course you take uh, Gregor's uh, or all the team implementations here, and they are also rate coding implementation, I think. I'm not saying it's wrong, yeah. But you can go even to other implementations like Chevalier and Tarot implementation, we using spikes, we did another one as well using spikes, but you still get the same parameters, except that instead of rate coding, you use uh, leaf, leak integrate and fire neurons. And you get kind of the same dynamics. And there are many others. But in all of them, you find the same parameters and the same dynamics. And often, you get a manifold, let's say, the space is 1 to 3D maximally, usually, or 4D when you have these slices. Um, usually fixed dimensionality, and everything is computed using matrix, from what I've seen in general. And you do a convolution, but uh, that's the integral, but the convolution has a cost. So that's why you cannot, let's just say, make a matrix in six dimension and just run it with this convolution, because it will be too, too expensive to compute on computers. And also not neurologically plausible to have like a six dimensional matrix in the brain, let's say. So, uh, how to deal with high-dimensional data? And uh, the consequence is the curse of dimensionality. So when you increase dimension, each point, neighbors become, well, if you have one dimension, one point, you have two neighbors. Two dimension, you get uh, eight. Three dimensions, you, you add up this way. So you get uh, three to the power of the dimension minus one element. So it goes really fast. So you don't want to have these kernels in huge uh, dimensionality. So there is one approach, which is a brute force approach. You try it anyway. So you use convolution with higher order matrix. And the complexity uh, makes it uh, non-affordable. You can use uh, numerical linear algebra to improve it. So you can both combine uh, singular value decomposition. So this is math methods to decrease the complexity. Because the kernel is uh, made of Gaussian, so this is very easy to decompose with using that. Uh, Fourier transform, which also helps to decrease the complexity, but in all the cases, it still remains uh, quite expensive to do. And also, you can go to hardware implementation using either GPU, FPGAs, so to make things more parallel. But it has some drawbacks as well and some problem with connectivity. So if you have six dimensions, uh, you still need to connect to many, many things. So when you go to hardware, which is in two dimensions, you still get some problems. Maybe Benoit can correct me on this, but... Yeah, no, this is not. Yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> OK. <laughs> or yeah, Julia as well and yours. Uh, second way of doing that, you just reduce dimensionality. So this is done in many approaches. So you say, well, you have a huge space, but actually your behaviors are in much uh, s smaller space, like two or three dimensions is enough. So you use machine learning techniques. Again, SVD, but you only keep the first elements, so the most important ones. PCA is similar. But sometimes you get dimensions which are hard to interpret and hard to couple. So for learning, it's not so easy. And for interpretation as humans, it's even harder. Uh, you can use self-organizing maps. So you project your space in two dimensions using a statistical learning, for instance. But of course, if you project a high-dimensional space in 2D, you get things that might happen in the brain, actually, uh, like shares of the space. So you if you have three dimensions and you try to project it in two, you might just uh, yeah, tear apart the, the space and to put it in two. And distortions as well, which have good aspects and bad aspects. And you can try to combine things directly. So some dimensions, you might say, oh, this one is important for this, this one also. And you just put them together using some fixed combination. So this is what happens with most uh, feature detectors and descriptors. You just find the right dimensions to extract, and you just generate a new dimension, let's say, that combines everything. Question. Yeah? SYFs are, in my understanding, they are really just a Tick. dimension extraction. They're not really using them. The true, I mean, the true underlying dimension is more than, uh, you're not going to get two dimensions. 
You mean with the detectors and descriptors, or? The DSO and the sun. Is that for the maps? Mm, you mean you're not getting a reduced dimension from them? So I guess they're two different ways. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. You get a better representation. But if the two dimensionality is high, yeah. then you yeah, you won't be Yeah, right. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, that's why either you have yeah, uh, for instance you get a visual input with let's say a matrix of inputs you don't know the structure, that's more like uh, Mathieu's work, uh, Mathieu Le Four works for instance with these self organizing maps. And you have intrinsically two dimensions, so then you extract them and they are projected right on the field after <laughs> many, many steps. But if you get a 3D input, which happens as well with U plus position and so on, then you get this, yeah, this sharing usually because you need to distort the 3D space in two dimensions. So this is where you can still reduce, well, reduce it, extract the three dimensions, project them in 2D, but you get, because of this projection, some, some problems. This is, this is what I meant using that. But it's true that there are two, two different things, extracting plus uh, projection and compression of Reducing dimensionality. So if you have ones like in these normal models, you have uh, really a four dimensional space because that's what you want to control. Yeah. It doesn't do any job. Before. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm not using them, but okay. yeah. Yeah, that's why, well, for me, yeah, that's really, that's when, I mean, if you're really intrinsically high dimension, you cannot do project them in 2D anyway. You, are, you destroy the space too much. And just to, for instance, yeah, and then it should be fast. Um, so for this combination, I will just go back to add something to the saliency things that we've been talking a lot uh, previously. So, well, I will just show pictures. So this, this is w one way of having saliency. So I guess you, kn how many of you know these things? Uh, yeah, a lot, so yeah. So this is our, the different dimensions for saliency. So orientation, for instance, even movement, so we're good at discriminating things that go faster. Color, of course, but when you get a mix of them, it's not so trivial anymore because actually, that's the hypothesis from the ETN core paper, which is quite old already, uh, is that we just by default sum all these things. So if nothing just stands out because of one dimension, you're not able to find it. So in this case, there is only one, which is a combination of orientation and color, which is the only red bar, which is straight. But actually, even with that basic combination, you can get easily what is naturally silent. For instance, something, uh, let's say, green and small in the middle of fill. And we are also, as humans, very good to design uh, artificial artifacts that are silent because we choose them so as they are silent. So we choose artifacts, for instance, for danger that is red and white with constricting, with edges, because they are easy to see. So this is already quite good for this. And actually, in the architectures, uh, so now there are some variations where you can bias dynamically the weight. So I could have uh, cited uh, work from the group, but I also add other references, for instance, to fix and all in 2010. And more in robotics, you have Frintrop, for instance, that made work on combining uh, the saliency maps with dynamical weighting, depending on the context. And uh, just a small anecdote is that initially, uh, the way, uh, the way making the competition in this thing, which is, I mean, in 90, so this one is the uh, most well known and they were using another technique, but if you look at the paper from, I think, 96 or 95, they were using actually neural networks with lateral connection, global inhibition, to select the most salient thing. So that's, I think, quite funny that we're, they were using something very close to neural fields to make the selection back then. So, and then it, the field went to something different, but initially it was really, Neural, recurrent neural networks with global inhibition. Uh, yeah, but still it doesn't do all the work because you, you need to uh, adapt this and to, depending on the context, you might need some dimension and not the others. So to just finish with that, um, you can do what, what's been shown by Sebastian, like you can couple lower dimensional maps and project in 1D map, go back to 2D and combine them in many ways. Uh, but sometimes, as was shown, you get a binding problem in 
So you need two dimensions, but it's true also when you go to three or four dimensions. Sometimes you need this binding in higher dimensions, but you don't get it because you're limited to two or three dimensions. You can do over projection. So there are many works with neural fields where you project activity using uh, bands <laughs> and uh, like uh, area to area <laughs> connections. So you can learn these connections, but there are some constraints. But you can overdo uh, over approximation, so you can use to go faster, like spiking neurons, you only use uh, connections when there are spikes. So it's, of course, faster, but you still need to update the potential for all neurons. So if you get a matrix implementation, it's still as slow. And finally, uh, so this is what I've uh, chosen. You can really go back to the equation, to the original equation, and instead of just transforming it into a matrix. You can say what's interesting, actually, if you take the Amari paper, it's only math and continuous equations. You can keep the continuum and just say, I approximate this function with Gaussian mixtures, for instance. So instead of taking a matrix and sampling regularly, you make a Gaussian approximation of the function, which, well, I will just skip that. So what it looks like, so imagine it's continuous, so it's a matrix here. But you can say, once you've converged onto a peak, you get only, let's say, one Gaussian somewhere, almost. So you can, it's very easy to approximate and very efficient with almost one, one Gaussian. You get a mixture with one element, and it's very, very... How many of you know about Gaussian mixtures and this kind of thing? Mm. Sorry. <laughs> so, well, the thing is that you can approximate any function by just putting Gaussians, so normal distribution, let's say. Well, for those who do more statistics, it's a bit different. But just put them on top of the other, and you can approximate any function. It's like decomposing any function with these Gaussians. So even if something is very, very complex with noise and so on, you can still put many, many Gaussians together, and they will approximate it. So you can either do like regular sampling with receptive fields, which is actually what does the neural field when you put a matrix. You get each one in the original at least equations connected to many parts of the input. But what you can do is also say, OK, I don't need to keep them all. I can just like keep some points with the activity around. I can just keep the ones that are the most representative. And uh, then you get a, a totally arbitrary distribution. You get some points somewhere in this space. And these are the only ones that you might need. So you are only using a subset, let's say, a subset of elements in the matrix. And you only do computations with them. So you just take the same thing again. You have your uh, focus, but this time represented only by two elements, just with the center and the radius. Your input, you can decompose it again as a Gaussian mixture, and you can combine them using, uh, let's say, Gaussian mixture techniques. And in the end, you again get only one mixture, uh, only one uh, Gaussian, for instance. So it works almost the same, but just using Gaussian mixtures. Um, yeah. And I think I should, uh, yeah, I will stop here, I think. So that's one way of doing that. So the good thing, I will maybe go to the conclusion. Mm. There are not too many slides, but maybe long to do. Um, what you get is that you get, uh, let's say, very low computational, computational cost. Because even if you have 20 dimensions, you still have a few Gaussians in it. So it's not uh, depending on the number of dimensions. It only depends on the complexity of the dynamics of the input. And as soon as you converge, you get only a few, let's say, Gaussians. So it goes quite fast. Um, so it's just an over approximation. So let's say it's not totally artificial. It's just that instead of going to matrix representation, you can just take any distribution and try to approximate it with it. And you still get the original properties. Um, you can couple it quite easily with, uh, let's say, robots and so on, because usually you get just signals, for instance, for position angles, not population coding, but just one, one, one angle, for instance, that is, that is given. And you can use it for very high-dimensional high uh, neural fields. Yeah, and this is not what I explained. So yeah, you can have a very sparse representation. Yeah. Uh, 
um, yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> I should go into details, and, but um, all the time, you, yeah. All no, I don't think so. All the time you still keep for the input, you still keep all the, all the elements. So at all the time, I mean, if you let the system converge, you get only one Gaussian. But all the time I still keep activities that are above some threshold, like above zero, well, above the minimal value. So you still get many, many Gaussians that are kept just in case of these instabilities. So they are kept in activity, but they are, if they are confirmed by stimulation again and again, they'll build up, build up, and replace the other one. So only the ones that are really killed by the lateral, well, lateral interactions are just dismissed. So you don't really go down to like one Gaussian immediately. So you keep all the time the ones that come from the input. And the amplitudes of these Gaussians yeah. are, do they have sort of Amari like dynamics or, or I, I, yeah, I try to reproduce that, but using like yeah, Gaussian mixture equations to combine uh, Gaussians. Usually when you have yeah, two peaks uh, on side and they are merge, you get one Gaussian in the center. And same if you add Gaussians together, they build up like, like peaks. So you get a very, well, when you look at the simulations, they really look at the, like the classical, um, classical dynamics. Yeah, right. Not, well, it's, well, it's so I took the equation from the Gaussian mixture models. So it's just, yeah, you, you combine variance with the mean and you have some equations to adapt the variance and adapt the, the amplitude, sorry, the mean and the amplitude depending on the, well, the three parameters like position, variance, and, uh, and amplitude. But actually in this uh, work here, I, do not, yeah, I did not ad adapt the variance because I was more interested in the tracking stuff. So let's say assuming the input is at some size, you, well, you can just adapt like the amplitude and position, and it works as well. But yes, but I don't understand it's where the dynamic system is. Oh, um, uh -huh. <sighs> here actually, uh, at any point, except the operations are not uh, like plus and so on, but you have a, a union and intersection of sets of Gaussians. So the operations are transformed into unions and intersections. And then once you have intersections of Gaussians and they are overlapping, there are overworlds in Gaussian mixtures to merge them, for instance, to make one Gaussian from two Gaussians. But you still keep exactly the equation where you just, when you have a sum, it's a union. Uh, when you have um, yeah, the minus, you just add a minus the decay, for instance. You just add one Gaussian with a smaller amplitude. And then you need to merge them all together. Yeah, but it's, yeah. it's, well, it's exactly like when you go to error approximation of one continuous uh, equation, you have exactly the same conversion that is made with uh, Gaussian mixtures usually. You, you suppose you have an infinite uh, mixture um, of Gaussians and you have rules to implement them in computers which require to do this merging and so on. But theoretically, you just have rules to, to compute um, yeah, any mixture. Different, you know, yeah, no, it's, you just apply rules to, mer but you ca can keep them together and add just the amplitudes, but the, the goal being to make it faster, you need to merge Gaussians quite often. This is the most expen expensive step is to all the time merge Gaussian to avoid them to grow in numbers. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, sorry it was so long, and yeah, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>